Okay, I want to start talking about uh, definite integrals for functions with several variables. Um, specifically, I want to work with functions with two input variables um, because it's it's much easier to visualize. Um, so here, a uh, function graph looks like a surface, right? A two-dimensional surface. Uh, and we're talking about computing the volume that's sitting underneath that surface, um, uh, sitting above uh, the domain um, or the xy plane. So let's let's take a look. Okay, so uh, it's good to review uh, what was done in the single variable case. So uh, if you have a function of uh, one variable. Um, this is a picture that I'm sure you have seen many, many times in Calculus 2. Right? We have a graph of a curve um, a function, and we're looking at area underneath the, that curve from particular point A to some other point B. Okay, and how this was done was that uh, you chop up the domain into slices, right? Um, some notches, uh, and then approximated the height of the graph at each of those slices. Um, and then added those uh, rectangles up because uh, area of a rectangle is an easy thing to compute. So it's the thickness of the slice uh, times the height of the rectangle. And that's right here. The thickness of the slice is uh, the length of the interval from b minus a to b, which is b minus a, and then you chop that up into n equal pieces. Um, so that would be the thickness for one slice. Uh, and then you use the, the height of the function, uh, but here you have a little bit of flexibility. You could have used uh, the left endpoint uh, to do a left hand row. You could have used the right hand uh, rule. Um, you could have used the midpoint for midpoint rule uh, and so on. So um, Xi, the only uh, sticking point was that um, the, the point that you chose uh, where you measured the height should be uh, within from that interval of that slice. <clears throat> and that will approximate uh, the area underneath the curve um, and then if we take the limit, as we take uh, skinnier and skinnier slices, um, that, that should converge to the, the true area uh, underneath the curve. So that was the idea of definite integral in one, one dimension. Okay. So let's, let's go to two dimensions. So now uh, what I wanna do uh, is to look at um, not so much an interval, but um, interval for each variable. So uh, x is going to be uh, changing from a to b, and y is going to change from c to d, and we're going to slice them uh, horizontally and vertically. Um, so slice up the x values and slice up the y values at the same time. Okay, so. Uh, the individual um, square or rectangular piece uh, that you have, well, uh, the area there is going to be uh, b minus a, which is the length of the, the interval in the x direction, uh, divided up into m little pieces. Uh, so you divide it by m. Um, and then in y direction, you're going to chop it up into n different pieces. and I mean, that could be the same, m could be equal to n, but it doesn't have to be, there's no reason why it has to be. Um, you could divide it up at a different rate if you like. Uh, and then uh, you have to pick a point to measure the, the height, the z coordinate that's sitting above this domain. Um, and that point x and y coordinate should come from somewhere in that little blue square. Okay, so here's, my attempt at drawing the three-dimensional version of the picture. So the rectangle that's shown here from um, A to B and C to D, 
uh, is the rectangle that's shown on the xy plane on the bottom. Um, this particular specific uh, small square or rectangle uh, is that piece. And you can imagine a uh, kind of rectangular tower that's uh, beaming out of it um, until it touches the surface uh, on the graph. Um, so the volume of that rectangular tower uh, is easy to compute. It's the, the area of the base, uh, which we computed here, uh, which will multiply uh, by, by the height of that surface near that point, um, near that square, right? So you, you pick up point in there uh, and measure the height. And we're gonna add them up. So we're gonna, I is gonna change from one through M so it's going to run through all of the x values, and uh, n is going to run through 1 through n. So all of the y values are kind of covered, um, and every, every combination will be added together. So you can imagine that we're computing the volume by computing the volume of, like, maybe, like, I, I'm kind of imagining, uh, like, chopsticks, bundle of chopsticks will be different heights, um, uh, and then we're, we're computing the volume of, of the total uh, object by measuring the volume of each chopstick and uh, adding them up. Okay, so similar ideas before, um, but it's going to be uh, double sum. Um, so notation-wise, we're going to use two integral signs for double integral. Okay, all right, and you might imagine if there's three variables, uh, yes, you'll be doing triple integral, right? Okay. Um, so if you're doing this on a rectangular region, it's actually not so bad. Um, it turns out that you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, you're basically doing um, one dimensional integration uh, twice, right? So uh, in fact, you could, you have a choice on which which way to integrate first. So uh, you can uh, think about that function as x fixed. Um, so x is a constant and just integrate over y from c to d. Um, so for each fixed x value, uh, you take a slice and compute the area uh, from c to d in that slice and uh, you'll get particular area, um, and then integrate that area from A to B with respect to X. So, so you're gonna take integration, fixing one variable at a time, um, and then after doing integral twice, you, you get the, the volume at the end. Um, you could also start from uh, X variable, changing from A to B, and once you compute that area, um, for a fixed value of y, uh, you're gonna change that y from c to d um, and compute the total volume. Okay, um, so th this is called the iterated integral. So you're just doing one dimensional integration uh, twice in a row. And it's kind of nice that um, in this setting, you're allowed to switch the order uh, the, the way you like. Um, and how you compute it would be inside out, right? So note that these values, A and B, the, the lower and upper uh, limits of the integration corresponds to dx. So the, those are the, the inner pair, right? The, the d variable and the lower and upper limit on the integral sign matches up. Um, and then the outer dy matches up with the cd. So it kind of matches, it pairs up like uh, parentheses, right? Um, okay, uh, let's do an example. So um, we have a function x squared times y, um, and we want to look at, uh, let's say, the rectangular region uh, 0, 3, 1, 2. So that when I write this notation, I mean, uh, X is changing from zero to three, and Y is changing from one to two, okay? 
um, so that we can compute this. So inside, um, we have x squared times y here. Uh, we're thinking of x as a constant. So I'm just taking that antiderivative of y. So we have antiderivative of y is y squared over 2. And y is changing from 1 to 2. Okay. All right, so uh, now what I do is I'm going to plug in 2 into the y. So I have x squared times 2 squared, which is 4 over 2, minus x squared times 1 squared over 2. Okay, so that simplifies down to um, 4 over 2 is 2. So 2x squared minus 1 half x squared uh, is going to be 3 halves x squared. Uh, oops. And we're going to integrate that from 0 to 3. The antiderivative of x squared is x cubed over 3. So um, I'm going to cancel out the 3 in the front uh, and just keep the 1 half. And x is changing from 0 to 3. So 3 cubed uh, is 27 over 2. Uh, and then we'll get 0 when we plug in 0. So I guess our answer is 27 over 2, um, or 13.5, I guess. All right, uh, that's uh, how what we get if we integrate with respect to y first. Um, let's do the exact same integral, uh, but we're going to integrate with respect to x first. Also, um, when I say treat it like a constant, I really do mean it. Um, so what I mean by that is that in the inside integral, y should be treated like a constant. And you can pull constants outside of the integral. So you can pull the y outside of the first integral, but not after, not outside of the second integral, because now it's a variable um, uh, as far as the second integral goes. So, so you could do it this way as well. So I pulled the y outside of the first integral. Um, now I just have to compute that antiderivative of x squared, which is x cubed over 3, where x is changing from 0 to 3. So I should have given myself more room here. Uh, let's see. So uh, I get 3 cubed is uh, 27 over 3 minus zero. Okay, uh, 27 over three is just uh, nine, right? So that's just a constant nine there. I'm gonna pull that outside of the integral. Okay, and antiderivative y is y squared over two, changing from one to two. So 4 over 2 minus 1 half. So 2 minus 1 half uh, is 3 halves. Uh, so 27 over 2. So same value um, either way. Um, OK, so uh, you worked out. Um, and this is just not, not a coincidence. This is a general uh, rule, uh, although there are certain conditions where this, this could fail. Um, so let's look at the next theorem. So Fubini's theorem says that if the function is continuous on the entire rectangle, um, and when I say entire rectangle, I mean all the way to the edges as well. So that not only that it's continuous inside of the rectangle, on the bo border as well, okay? So if you have a continuous uh, function on a rectangle, then uh, you can integrate it x first, y first, it doesn't matter. Uh, you're going to get the same value of the 
uh, at the end. Okay, and um, uh, again, this this class is not gonna reach to a point where I'm gonna trick you with uh, in a case where this doesn't hold. Um, but I, I do want you to be uh, aware that this could fail, right? So I, it's easy to come up with an example this time. So I, I'm going to. Um, so let's look at uh, the function x over y. Okay. Um, and I'm looking at the uh, rectangle from negative one to one for x value and zero to one for y value. Um, notice that this thing is not continuous when y is equal to zero, right? This on the boundary where uh, y value is equal to zero um, because then we have division by zero. Um, if we try to take the integral um, with x first, um, let's see what happens. So uh, y is a constant with respect to x, so I'm gonna pull that outside. Antiderivative of x is x squared over two, and x is changing from negative one to one. And uh, that's just one half minus one half. So that's the integration of zero. You're gonna get zero. So if you integrate with x first, then you're gonna get zero. Uh, if you integrate with y first, um, so let's let's take the x out, the integral. Uh, the antiderivative one over y is natural log of y. Y is changing from zero to one, and um, natural log of y is zero. Uh, but when you try to plug in y, natural log uh, blows up to negative infinity uh, as y gets closer and closer to zero. Um, so it, the, the limit doesn't exist. Okay. Um, so the, the, the volume doesn't exist um, if you try to integrate with respect to y first. Um, but it, it does exist uh, if you try to integrate with respect to x first. So we're getting two different answers. Um, and this is a case where Houdini's theorem fails, right? Um, and uh, this doesn't violate the theorem because uh, it, it didn't satisfy the condition, right? It, it wasn't a continuous function on the entire rectangle. Um, so um, it is important to uh, make sure uh, that you have a continuous function. Although uh, I will, I'll promise you, like I'm not going to try to gotcha um, on an exam situation, um, but, but you should be aware of it. Okay. Um, another thing I want to mention is that uh, it, it looks like you have uh, choice and, and you do, but um, integration is sometimes a lot harder uh, if you do one side over the other. In fact, sometimes it's impossible to do it one, one variable first, although if you try integration with the other variable first, uh, you're able to compute it. So if you set up one way and it doesn't work, you can try the other way and see if it's, uh, uh, you can make progress that way. Um, so this is an example where you could actually do it either way. Um, but one way is definitely easier than the other. Right? So um, let's set it up both ways. So let's, um, if we integrate with respect to x first, so x is changing from zero to one. And y is changing from zero to two. So that's one way to uh, integrate. So, Thinking of y as um, constant, uh, how you'd integrate uh, x times exponential function would be 
uh, doing integration by parts. Um, so you might say u equal to x uh, and dv equal to uh, e to the xy dx. And antiderivative of that would be one over y e to the xy. Uh, let me put the dx. <clears throat> and I didn't give myself enough room, so I'm not gonna compute the rest. But uh, that's that's some amount of work. And after you do integration by parts, you still have to do another integration after that. Um, but uh, if we set it up the other way, um, so integrate with respect to y value first, then um, you can kind of ignore the x in front. That's just a constant. So what is the, what is the antiderivative of e to the constant times y? Well, it's going to be, you have to do a u substitution. But when you do that, um, you're going to get one over the constant in the front. And y is changing from zero to two. And look, uh, one over x and x will cancel out and you're gonna get an easier integral overall. Um, let's compute the antiderivative first cell. So e to the 2x minus e to the zero is equal to one. Okay, uh, and then now the x will cancel out and we just have the integral from zero to one, e to the 2x minus one. And antiderivative will be one half e to the 2x minus x. And x is changing from zero to one. Okay, I ran out of room, but I trust that you could finish this problem by plugging in one and then subtract plugging in zero. Um, I'll leave that part up to you. Okay, uh, I wanted to squeeze in, um, literally squeezing in um, another problem. So uh, sometimes we could ask you a question in a different way, uh, connecting it to the previous material and uh, and you could, you could handle it with a new setting. So uh, imagine we have a plane, uh, x plus three y plus two z equals to 10. So that's a plane that's going through at x, y, z axis. Um, and I want the volume beneath that plane uh, in this region where x is between zero and one and y is between one and two. Um, so you might be thinking like, well, I don't have a function here, but you actually do. Um, you could look at this plane as a function if you solve for z. So uh, if you think, if you just bring the x plus three y over to the other side, and divide both sides by two. Uh, then you have z is equal to some function of x and y, and you can integrate this guy uh, on, in this region. So uh, let's see, um, x is changing from zero to one, and y is changing from one to two. And this is the function I'm working with. So I'm gonna match up with y value and then the x value next. And um, I, I'm not gonna finish this problem because uh, um, it's pretty straightforward, uh, but I guess the, the meat of the problem is recognizing equational plane could be rewritten as function of two variables, x and y, um, if you think of z as the output variable. Um, so you could, uh, you could actually compute volumes that way. Cool, right? Okay. All right, so I think this is where I'm gonna stop the video. Um, I'll see you later.